Okay, so this is a video looking at um, resistance to motion. And we're going to be, let me just write that down. Then. Resistance, uh, let's say due to friction <clears throat> in fluids. And we are going to be looking at objects that fall through air and objects that fall through liquids. Um, let's deal with the, uh, the liquid one to start with. When an object falls through liquid, it has a weight associated with it, of course, which we're familiar with, mg, and it also has a, let's call it drag force that's pulling it back. We're going to quantify this force in this video. Also, if this liquid is fairly viscous and quite heavy, there's also going to be a buoyancy force. In other words, the volume of liquid that it's displaced is going to equal an upthrust on this object, um, hence its buoyancy. So it's going to be equal to the weight of the liquid which it has displaced. Okay, now we're looking at um, what happens um, or can we measure when this reaches a terminal velocity? So at a terminal velocity, we know that these three forces are all, sorry, the weight is going to balance the drag and the buoyancy force. So we'd say at um, V terminal, then weight equals drag plus buoyancy. Good, we can get some expressions for this. And what I want to try and do is I want to show you what the expression for this one is. It's called Stokes's law. And it's quantified as some constants, six pi uh, nu, which is the viscosity of the water, <clears throat> multiplied by the radius of the object and the velocity that's falling through. That's what the force is equal, that's Stokes's theorem. This is obviously a constant, this is a constant, this is a constant, this is um, obviously the radius of the ball that we're throwing through, and finally we have velocity, how fast it's moving. The buoyancy, of course, is going to be equal to the volume of water, uh, the weight of water displaced, which is the same as the volume times by the density of the liquid, which is in effect 4 over 3 pi r cubed by the density of the liquid displaced. <coughs> Good, okay, and so what we need to do is we need to sum this all together into this substitute in and rearrange. Of course here the weight is going to be exactly the same, it's going to be 4 over 3 pi r cubed t of the steel times by g, hold on, I need to times that all by g. Okay, so let's see if we can try and find an expression for this one. I mean, needless to say, probably most often than not, you're not needing to know this expression here, but I want to try and equate this all in terms of the radiuses and see whether we can measure the radius of the ball and how that might affect the terminal velocity. That's why I'm plugging in all these numbers here. And it's quite useful to see how good your algebra is. So therefore, let's go for 4 over 3 pi r cubed density of the steel ball times g will equal 6 pi nu rv plus 4 over 3 pi r cubed density of the liquid by g. Get rid of pi's throughout. We can get rid of 1r throughout. And so therefore I'm looking to get, of course that's going to be a terminal velocity when this is um, balanced. So therefore, let's try and rearrange this. Take that over to that side, give me 4 over 3 r squared g, the density of the steel minus the density of the liquid, equaling 6 nu v terminal. Um, I'll get rid of a half on both sides there, leaving me with, let's drag those functions down, <coughs> 2r squared g rho steel minus rho liquid divided by 9 nu 
gives me V terminal. So you can just see that there. So why is that useful? What I'm going to do is I've now got a, um, all of these are constants. G is constant two, nine, N is the viscosity of the liquid, which is constant. We're using glycerol. The steel ball is very much le um, greater than the liquid. So therefore this sort of just turns into the density of the steel ball. Uh, but we're just being precise, we're leaving it all in. But essentially what we're doing is we're discovering that the terminal velocity V is proportional to R squared if this obeys Stokes's law up here. So what I'm looking to get is I'm looking to see whether my velocity and my R squared are directly proportional. And if they are, then my gradient is equal something complicated, but 2G over 9 new density of steel, density of liquid. And you know what? This is all one big constant, so it should remain the same. So, um, so I mean, we don't need to work this out, but these values could be discovered um, to see whether V against R squared is proportional. Okay, we probably want to see the experiment itself to see what's going to happen. And also, we probably want to draw a table of results. Um, let me just show you what we're looking for in terms of the table of results. I've actually got the results here. <clears throat> I've got my independent variable on the left, and I've done the diameter of the ball, because when you can, when you know, see the actual um, size of the balls we're using, we're going to have to use... Um, micrometer to be able to deal with it. And the balls themselves, which are covered in glycerine at the moment, are tiny. Some of them are incredibly small. And the reason why they need to be so small is because we want the time period to be as large as possible when it falls through the glycerine. And in order to achieve that, we needed a very small ball. So that's why I've measured the diameter, because they're so small and we're measuring that. Um, of course, I've got the time to drop, and I've measured out 30 centimetres. Um, I've got three values. You can see that initially they're incredibly large values for this tiny ball. And then they come down to being <coughs> pretty fast values towards the bottom. And then because it's 30 centimetres, I can work out my terminal velocity, and then I've taken the diameter and I've squared it on the other side. So if you want to take down those results, feel free to do so whilst I show you the actual setup. And we have marked out. Let's see if I can move this and show you. We have a cylinder of glycerine. Now what I've done is I've marked on here, quite roughly, one red mark fits at a position of 30 centimetres, and then there's another red mark right at the bottom, just out of view, um, which is at zero, and a nice scale down the side. So as objects are dropped in here, and I'll drop you can see, you can see it drops, and we're going to time it between this point here and that point there, and assume that in this period it's accelerated, so it's at a terminal velocity, and then it goes down. Uh, so um, easily done. So we have different size balls. If you go closer to the liquid, then it's not going to accelerate to too fast a speed before it hits, and therefore it won't have to deaccelerate before it reaches there. But you'll see that some of them quite gracefully fall. Of course, you're looking to um, um, place your eye level with the ball. So when you time it there, you come down and the parallax is not going to be an issue. And therefore, I've put a complete ring around. So when this lines up with the other side, you know you're at 90 degrees. And finally, um, so they're quite heavy. This is a very heavy ball. If you look how quickly this one moves, timing's got to be very fast with that one. So you're probably likely to get the greatest error. This is a tiny one that I'm about to drop. You'll just see it falling beautifully. Um, 
maybe you won't, but it's just here at the moment, just following there, actually next to a bubble moving up. So that's why we've got such a beautiful time of 22 seconds on this one. If anyone, anything, this one's going to create the big, the most accurate result. It's still falling, even still, as we go down. Okay, so those are the results. You've seen the setup. Um, the results, oh, uh, how do you get them out again? Well, very simply, we use a magnet. And the magnet will quite happily bring them back to the surface again. And if you want to, you could actually suspend them in the, with the magnet and then release and then watch them drop. But um, of course, it's best to do it three times and then repeat. Okay, so just coming back to the results again. Just make sure we're happy with this. There are the results. <clears throat> and we're going to plot the velocity against the radius squared to see whether this relationship is proved correct. Okay, hope that makes sense.